Well, welcome, folks, to our masterclass with uh, Phil Taggart, the author of the book um, Slacker's Guide to the Music Industry. Um, so, Phil, that's not all you do. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your role in the music industry. Yeah, I, I've been sort of like in and around music for as long as I can remember. Um, I played in bands when I was a kid and uh, like we used to try and get shows everywhere. So like I kind of learned at a very early age that you kind of have to hustle um, to get your your band anywhere. And like all those like little lessons that you learn when you're like 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, trying to get gigs all around the country, you, you don't really realize it, but you're actually starting to sort of like build up a little repertoire of people that you know, and then sort of like being in and around music sometimes means that you, you veer off into different places. So from playing in the band, I ended up wanting to work on a new music show um, that was on the radio. And then from there, I ended up getting on the radio, um, talking about records on a, across the line on Radio Ulster. And from there, I sent off a demo to, to Radio One, which would be like, you know, the one of the biggest places for new music in, in the world, really. And uh, I got a, got, got a job there at Radio One um, and then left Radio One after 10 years there um, at the end of 2020. Uh, started up a brand new show on on Spotify, um, which is called Chill the Beats, and um, yeah, and I'm doing that. Started a record label, released a book, uh, started a few podcasts, <laughs> and generally kept myself fairly busy. I'm stressing myself out just listening. To it. <laughs> yeah, so it seems like a seems like a lot of work. Uh, so uh, I have your book here on my on my Kindle. So um, it's really like a, a how to and how to break in the music industry. Um, all of our Midtown Sounds participants this year um, are going to be uh, given a given a book. Um, it's lots of there's interviews in there too, isn't there? There's uh, you, you've Aye, taken look, people of, in the industry. Loads of interviews. I think like with, with um, if if one person tells you that they have all of the knowledge of the music industry, that they're they're most definitely lying because there's so many different facets and different bits and pieces like you know yourself from any artist uh, that's watching this that may have stuck out uh, a release that you know there, there's the PR side there's the music side there's the recording side there's the live side there's the festival side you know like, there's so many different bits of it so like I know little bits and pieces but I didn't think I knew enough to completely fill a book and I felt like I wanted to learn along the way as well so I had um, 60 odd interviewees um, from various different facets of the interview, um, uh, of the sorry, music industry, whether that's the bands themselves, like your Wolf Alice's and your Run the Jewels and Lil Sims and Blossoms and George Ezra's who are given their uh, pearls of wisdom on various different um, topics, um, but also like the people who run those industries as well, like the, the top publishers, um, the the top music uh, like record labels, the top music managers, and putting them all in one place, and you're seeing lots of different advice from lots of different um, places. So you can kind of take what they're all saying and kind of make up your own mind and how that fits into your career. Yeah, because you often find that most artists, uh, you know, you can maybe be very good at two or three facets of that. You know, some of them still come under the bracket of being creative. Um, and you can find that those are the things artists really uh, excel at, but maybe some of the business side of it um, is where they would where they would fall down. So it's good that it's, it covers all bases. Um, just then, maybe when we're talking about being creative, would you have uh, many tips um, that you've come across to help people be creative, to help people sort of get in that zone? It's it's difficult. Cre creativity is probably one of the most difficult things to actually um, to sit down and, and talk about, like scientifically because like everybody's completely different I, I know people who write songs who can wake up in the morning make a cup of coffee and start writing a song and they might bash it a couple in the day and I know other people that could write one or two in a year <laughs> like it, it, it really it really yeah, I can't remember there's a famous quote there you know if, if I knew where songs came from I'd go there more often yeah. so maybe it's a bit uh, a bit redundant they, they, to try and have that but you have to be in it to win it though at the same time like i mean you you have to be trying to 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 write songs and and sometimes a great piece of advice which was about creative writing um that somebody said to me and and it works exactly the same with, with songwriters is sometimes you need to write the bad one to get it out of the way to get to the good one so sometimes like you know you might feel a, you you finish a song and you're like oh do you know what i don't really, even really like that but that's good because that means that like you know you've kind of cleared that 
part of your brain that was focused on that song and is opening up um, like a, a brand new part that's going to spore off ideas into um, a, a new piece of music. So I think like you need to be like uh, dedicated because I think like with with um, creativity and songwriting and, and successful songwriters, the one thing that they all have in common is that they're doing it all the time. And it's not it's not something that they just jump into and go, oh, I've come up with uh, um, Adele's Hello or, you know, I, I've come up with like, um, you know, like the, the brand new Bieber track or <laughs> whatever. Like these people are just at it all the time and they write more songs that never get heard and the, the more songs that they don't like than they do ones they do like, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and then once you've got that and you've, you've been creative and you're, you're doing all that there, um, maybe you could touch on how to start building your fan base and per- perhaps even if you have any of like the local artists in the Northern Irish scene that you think's making a particularly good job of going through those stages and, and building that fan base. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the fan base is the most crucial part of, of what it is you do because they are the people that are going to come to your shows. They're the people who are going to buy your merch. They're the people who are going to share your tracks and they're going to be the people who share um, your music online, your music videos and all the rest of it. Like, And they, they really have to be the foremost thought in your mind when, when it is you're writing music because like it's, it's easy to like write a song and put it online and then wait for a fan base. That doesn't normally happen. Like, I mean, like it doesn't normally just something completely click like that and and there you go you've got an instant fan base people who who tend to build a fan base tend to have an idea of the people that they want to listen to their show or sorry listen to their their songs and they have to like have an idea of like who they are you know if you're playing like in a metal band and you're like you know you're, you're properly dressing up to your instagram looks proper death metal you've got a font that nobody can read i mean people know what that is and they yeah, can identify yeah, yeah. With it. like uh, and it's easily identifiable um i mean when you looked at like when uh, say a band a big band from back home like uh like two-door cinema club right when they when they were kicking off around the early 2010s they were a bunch of preppy indie boys from from banger and they were all very well like highly stylized well well dressed very like big colors and the, 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 almost like what they were wearing was yeah like what you what you were, like what you were hearing yeah yeah and it was cre- creating this like a uh, massive package that like you would want to buy into so like you know if you were an, an indie pop fan you were like right well this is they, 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 these these are the people that i want to follow into the sun and and i think you you kind of need to think like that when when you're putting your own um stuff together like if you're a punk rock band but these are all just like i don't know he's all like you just like you've you got bad I, i'm a massive fan of like bad press shots like you know you, you all you have to do is google your favorite bands uh, or your favorite artists and look at their press shots and go right i need to get mine to a level that's close enough to that because if you think that like a press shot is just you uh standing beside a brick wall um looking in, in your old garb um it's it's not it's much more than that you have to think about it and i'm not just saying like you know it's photos and it's Instagram that builds fan base. The, the biggest thing that builds a fan base is good songs, but it's creating the atmosphere around it for people to come in um, and feel welcome within those songs and feel like part of the family. I, I do think uh, I speak with a, a fella, you know, he's a, he helps local businesses and he, he's talked, he always says to me, you know, some of these local businesses, they're not making it easy for local people to do business with them. And if you apply that to the music, you know, you have to make it easy for people to, to do business with you and your business is music. Um, and I think it's important what you said there, but, you know, going and looking at your favorite artists and stuff, a lot of this information is out there, you know, and you can sort of start to see a trend or a thread of how these people, the, the show, you know, look at the shows they play and the venues they play. And they do tend to have, you know, this kind of ladder as to how you can, and, you know, if you're maybe on it, but you're a few levels below them, well, there'll be landmarks there that maybe show you, I think that's 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 an important thing in itself is, is that you you use all of the bands and artists that you enjoy as case studies so like it, it's it's not just like you know sitting back and going right we're gonna do what 
X banded or Y banded, it's like looking going almost like forensically at it and looking at it and going, well, you know, why are they so popular? Like what, what, what difference ha- is there between what I'm doing and what they're doing? And sometimes the difference can be, you know, the, the, just the songwriting is incredibly, like, you yeah. know, it can be incredibly different, but uh, there's bands out there who have bigger fan bases with not, incredible music but really know how to like market yeah. themselves um you have a, a chapter in your book on on management um what sort of uh, were all the artists and people you interviewed were they they feel a certain you know was there a struggle in terms of ma- management they think it definitely benefit them having having management or do, did they all have the same kind of thoughts on you know what stage you should get management and all that kind of thing well, there's there's lots of different d- different ways and means into it and like a, a good manager it is worth its weight in gold um when it when it comes to to your career because obviously having somebody who is in the music industry and has connections in the industry is going to make your life a lot easier because you're going to be knocking down doors that might not open whereas they might have the keys to those doors and be able to knock them down and be able to go look. this is who I'm looking after right now. And that means quite a lot when, when um, there's an oversaturated market and you've got somebody who's fighting your corner for you. But in saying that, like, you know, a bad manager can really set you back sometimes as well. Like, I mean, I, in my band, I've had, when I, when I was a kid, like uh, I had bad managers <laughs> that, yeah. that, that, that were going out and doing the wrong things. And, uh, creating a negative profile for for us and on on a local scene really more than anything else and you know that that can sometimes be a be a, a hold back i uh, uh what's your interview with joel harkin on the um on the output festival and you were saying you know that uh there's maybe a bit of hope for a few years to come where it where you know at the minute there's no real school to go to for for management and northern ireland doesn't have the bims or the or the kind of structure in place um, but that's maybe maybe some of these artists might because uh, you have to. It's not always you're going to make your living being a, a full time artist. So maybe this is something that these guys could could try and, and harness in, in some way to to try and go out and find what that might what that might be that those management skills and yeah and no. become management for each other. Well, I mean, like absolutely because like when when you're a band and you're looking after your own band and if you have the business new to be able to like do that then you effectively are a manager and you're kind of learning um, along the way. And, and every really every band, until they get a manager, manages themselves, but yeah. they just either manage it really well or really poorly. Um, one piece of advice I would give to, to bands doing it, like uh, more so than just solo artists, is that like it's very hard to manage a band by um, a democracy. <laughs> yeah, it's true. very hard to have four opinions going, this is what we should be doing. I would almost normally just elect one or two people max to like look after what's happening because you can get to the stage where it's analysis paralysis and there's like four people dissecting things and it's like that that just slows everything down so much that sometimes it's good just to have one or two people. But I mean, the music industry is quite a, quite a wide, um, wide industry and there's more going along than, you know, just, just writing songs and, and being part of the band. There's, and the, the and the industry is getting a lot bigger in, in Northern Ireland. There's a lot more opportunities. Um, you know, there's a lot more gigs and festivals happening. Well, you know, pre-COVID, yeah, yeah. and 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 hopefully post-COVID that that, that will um, continue. But the the music industry itself, like in Northern Ireland, is growing. Um, and there's much more ways out there for you to to get a to get a job in it. Uh, but like the only thing I would say is that it's massively competitive, and you really have to want it. Um, to get into it because you see a lot of people come in and just go no this isn't for me if you're looking to make short money don't get into the music industry like you know get into yeah, i think it has to be placed alongside those other careers or vocations really yeah you know, yeah it, it, it is. <laughs> you have to get and more out of the actual doing it than the, than the money you do and like i mean like even just be being a committed artist you have to do, want to do it for the music's sake like that's not to say that there isn't money to be made in it like there's there's um, artists like Snow Patrol and uh, Ian Archer and Two Door Cinema Club and Bicep and and Boy Fans and you know the list goes on um, of artists that are making a, an incredible wealth of money um, from doing what they're doing, um, whether that's from talent or fortune or or a mixture of all of those. Like you know, you still can 
go and 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 live a good life doing it but that's a smaller percentage than than there are than people who are actually making even a sustainable income um, you sort of mentioned their talent and, and fortune. Um, again, in that Joel Harkin conversation, you just touched on something that I have been speaking about to other people a lot recently. But I, I came to it from Roy Keane, um, where you know it's sort of that part, uh, that sort of triangle of um, talent, hard work, and luck. And you know, for success, you really need all three. And I, I think it's important for young musicians to realize that you know you might have all the talent and done all the hard work. And then, you know, it's just a matter of luck. That's the way, you know, I'm sure yourself and, and me personally can name countless bands who were as good as those who made it, but just, but just didn't. Um, would you, would you agree with that part of that triangle that, you know, it's, it, those yeah. are really the three keys to success? I, I, I do. I, I agree with it. Like, I mean, like, yes, you do. You need talent. You do need hard work. Like, and you really need to work hard, but the, like the luck thing is like, I, I think like a lot of that, you have to make your own luck in, in the in the, the the by which I mean like you need to be in the conversation for something to happen. So like you know, you can work hard at your music and you can be very talented, but you need to put yourself out there and, and within the the ring of people who who might be able to pluck you out and, and give you a record deal or give you a management contract or something, like you can't just wait for luck to happen because like it's, it's very seldom that I've ever heard of somebody uh, just getting a knock on their door going, here, I've been okay. big Johnny from so Sony Records just was yeah. driving by on a taxi and heard you wants to sign you. Like, you, you need to make a bit of that luck for you. And then the rest of that luck is in the fortune of the stars. Like, yeah. I mean, you need a lot of to, 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 to join up. Um, we touched a little bit earlier on on image. And I just wanted to ask you how, what you felt about, you know, image and originality there's a lot um there's a lot of chances now for people to get involved with online trends and i i see a lot of artists you know doing things online just because oh well this is what's happening at the minute in the world of you know social media so i have to jump on and give my version of it um you know so um would you have any sort of tips or thoughts on on that that idea of image and originality where it's good to pair yourself with some a certain genre or a certain trend of people but maybe also have your own yeah like i mean like it's to, to, like the the concept of true originality i haven't like I, you very 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 rarely ever see it because even your your favorite bands are all harp harping yeah. back to, yeah. to, to something i mean if you like look at let's take um let's take an example like say like Sam Fender, right? Yeah. Sam Fender playing the working class hero um, would have taken inspiration from Springsteen. He's played the working class hero, except one's from Gateshead and the yeah. other one's from, from New Jersey. And like Springsteen would have taken his from like, you know, early rock and rollers from like the the fifties, like Eddie Cock, like it all, it's, it's absolutely fine to beg, steal and borrow when it comes to originality, because really originality is born out of stealing from different people in an interesting way that, that creates something kind of new. Yeah. And, um, and I've always sort of felt that, you know, it, it's that it's oh, Sam, like say for somebody like Sam Fender, it's the fact that he's doing that through the eyes of someone from Gateshead that make his music just that. Yeah. Like, yeah. like Springsteen, but just that little bit different and, you know, more relatable to the, his audience. Cause he's, you know, it'd be his friends and his people and, Britain are able to look at where he's coming from and go, well, that's my community as well. So as long as you're kind of coming at it through your sort of eyes, I think that it does have some value. But that's it. I mean, we come from Northern Ireland, right? There's a lot of stuff to talk about. There's a lot of stuff to sing about. There's a lot of um, civil unrest. Um, there's a lot of problems with Brexit. I mean, there's so many political problems, but like also we have a unique voice here that isn't always represented like through through art the best i mean we have some good artists that that sing and i'm not just talking about politics but just like you know all of the topics that you cover in in songs like whether it's love or loss or um despair or or joy um you have a unique you have a unique voice there's only one person that's you who's writing a song yeah. from where you are like tell us about that tell us about your experiences and how that how, how that relates to you because i can guarantee not only will there be somebody 
in the same town five mile over the road that feels the same way as you there'll be somebody across the water that feels the same way as you there'll be somebody in germany that feels the same way as you like it's a, it's about making that connection um so i'd say one of the most or the things that that might help the artists that i deal with the most the local artists in, in balamina and the midney center and borough we have an awful lot of artists who are cover artists this kind of is the same sort of vein you know we have an awful lot of cover artists who maybe and the biggest struggle for them is breaking away from that and writing their own material. Um, yes. Have you come across anything over your time that maybe w- would help, you know, would help them? I think like taking that jump into writing your own material, like it, it sounds scary, but you don't have to share the first thing you write with people. Like the, a lot of um, your, your favorite artists, like I know because the, the Slacker podcast that I do, generally is revolves around the first demos that they've ever done but nobody will ever share with you the first song that they ever wrote or the first five songs the first 10 songs because you have to think about it like like any sort of skill like if you started playing football tomorrow you wouldn't expect to be starting for real madrid if you started writing songs tomorrow you wouldn't expect to be writing a number one you need to like learn your keepy uppies and you need to learn how to, to, to pass and shoot. And, and like, you know, like it's the same with songwriting. You need to give yourself that time to, to develop and get better. And there's a, a big thing with, with artists and songwriters is that like, you know, once you finish something, you get really excited about it and you want to share it around. And that's, that's totally fine. But I think like, don't just think that the first thing you're going to do is going to be a hit. That, that very, very rarely ever happens. Like I've worked with maybe two artists that have like their first song has been like, you know, really big or, or, or been or made like a bit of a dent. Yeah. So go and go and write something, write something today. G, G, C and D, that's all you need. And, and see how it is and get better at it and work at it and look at it as a craft. It just seems a little bit to me that, you know, from looking, I say looking into these artists, they feel like, oh, well, you know, because they were once in a place where even doing a cover was a bit, you know, and they wouldn't sing at a family party or they would, you know, I'll do that, but I couldn't sing in a pub. And they've mm-hmm. kind of conquered all these other levels. But it's just, you know, that, get you know, when I look at them and I, and I hear them and they're, they're fantastic musicians, they've got a voice, you know, they, they you know, they're, they're great on their instruments, but... You know what? What I'm sort of looking at them then is right. Okay, well, come on then. What's you know what 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 are we getting out? Of, you know what do you, what have you got to say? It it takes a while to for confidence to be built, and and confidence is a massive part of of anything. Confidence is a massive part of life. Like you know, like even you know, the confidence to go and speak to somebody new, the confidence to to go to class every day, the you know the the, the confidence to. To, to to speak to your family honestly about something like you know co- confidence is a is is one of the most important things in in life in general and in music you have to celebrate the small wins you have to set yourself small goals because the more you set the small goal and you overcome one you'll be like I, well I can do that you know like if you think about going right well I've never sung in front of somebody before and you sing in front of your family which <laughs> I mean that can be quite hard because you got Uncle Johnny going, here, do you know any of the gambler? But um, like setting yourself those small goals and just ticking them off one by one will give you such a sense of achievement and, and will hopefully garner an emotion to want to be able to do this more and more and more. I mean, like I have suffered from anxiety and, and panic attacks like over the years and when I was a young, young man from like 17 and I never thought I'd be able to speak on the radio. Uh, like I never thought I'd have the confidence to be able to speak in front of a load of people and, you know, to set myself small goals. And then over the years ended up speaking to a couple of hundred thousand people every, every week and then yeah. getting on TV and speaking in front of thousands of people live and, and stuff like that. And and that didn't happen overnight. Cause if it had, a, if, if I had got that the day after I had a th- thought, thought it, I wouldn't have been ready. And it's all about building these small things and building them up and, every time you get a wee bit more confidence it grows exponentially so it's just starting small and building up if we can move on to um another chapter in your book sort of is in you know there's one on publishing and one on distribution and when we not going to 
I do them in that a lot of detail, but you know, the distribution is, is totally different now than it was, you know, 10 years ago. And in some ways it's a lot easier. You know, you don't have to go through any, you, you know, you don't have to have a label or you don't, you can do it yourself. If you want a song on all the so big platforms, you know, you just upload it. But do you have any, you know, that's maybe also has its drawbacks in, in some ways as well. Do you have any tips, you know, maybe even lead in time for a single or is there anything you've picked up on the, on the distribution aspects that, that might be useful in publishing? Yeah, I mean, like getting your song distribution, if you're fresh to it, right, is basically just getting your song on all of the platforms that you might listen to, whether it's Apple Music or Spotify or Amazon or Deezer or or Google. Um, perhaps you might want to do a physical release. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that for your first one or two. Like build up a little bit of a fan base before, build up a fan base that you can sell it to first. Um, but when it took, comes to like putting your song online, the the, the big thing, that it used to be in my band anyway is like you come out of the uh studio that, and you'd be driving home and you'd be blasting the track and you'd be like yes that sounds amazing let's put it online tomorrow but you shouldn't do that like you should sit back and you know like make a plan for that song because you, like you put so much time writing it and so much time recording it and and mastering it that you want to give it the best chance that it possibly can have in in life so a lot of that is down to like planning how you do it. Um, so you need to figure out how you get it online first. So you can use a company like TuneCore, um, a company like CD Baby. Um, there's tons of them out there and it just takes a little a little Google to, to be able to find the right one. And then once you sort of have that, you know, give yourself like six weeks or eight weeks to, and, and put like, you know, upload the song have it have it up there ready to go have you have you released it all written down get yourself like a list of dates and what you have to do by dates and then at the very end of it have like you know release date um and in that time get your band press shots done write your press release make a list of people that you would love like a complete make an a list a b list and a c list of people you would love to hear it like you know radio one or or like enemy or or like you know a big spotify playlist or something and then, like, right, who are those people? How do you get in contact with them? And then while you're doing all that, get your artwork ready. Have an idea of, um, you know, the stuff that you're going to post on your Instagram, your Twitter. And then when the release comes up, have all of that going. Like, have loads of pictures up, have loads of videos up. Um, and get your friends to share it. Like, you, like you, when you release your first track, all of your friends will share it if you ask them because you've never done it before. If you try and get them the fifth time round, good luck to you. But like definitely use your friends for the first one. Get them to share it, retweet it, uh, repost it on their stories. Um, and just do as much of that at the start as you can because new bands get so much more um, love from their friends and family than, than they do when you've been doing it for a while. Yeah, I do think that's something maybe people underestimate is that people who know you already will want to hear you in this, you know, the boys in the football team or the girls at work or whoever it is, you know, they will want to hear what you're doing, you know, because they do, you know, I think sometimes you can be a little bit worried about what they might might, might say or what they might do, but, they, you know, if they know you play guitar or they, you know, you play piano or you're writing music, they do have, they do have that curiosity in them that they do want to want to hear it. Um you um, obviously have done a lot of work with the BBC. A great tool for our local artists here is the BBC Introducing. And it really mm. has been the launch pad for, you know, an awful lot of um, artists in this in this country. Have you any tips about breaking through that? You know, you've done a bit of BBC Introducing work yourself. Do you, what are they particularly looking for? Or I think, like, they, they're looking for bands that can, that, that can make it... <laughs> They're looking for bands that look like they're taking it seriously because you, you you get sent a lot of stuff and it feels like a, a half arsed hobby. And if it if it feels like a when you when you're like clicking on the link and it's poorly recorded, or um and that doesn't mean you have to spend loads of money going into the studio, like it just means you have to spend more time working on how it sounds. Like that's the most important bit is like making sure that the song's good, number one, making sure it's recorded well. And then making sure all of the the sprinkles and cherries that uh, go along with it, like your 
profile on social media and all the rest of it look good because when it looks good people are going to take it more seriously and the more seriously that they take it the more they'll listen to the track because they'll be like oh wow this looks good right well let's listen to the track um i mean i kind of go the other way where i'll listen to the track first and then if it's good i'll go and check all the rest of it out but i think like that's the most important bit and make sure you're sending the right song in are you like you have to sit back and ask yourself the question really are you ready? Because you have to be ready. So, like, you could just stick up something in the first thing you've recorded, but is it the best thing you've recorded? And are you going to be better if you write another load of songs in six months' time? Or is this the time that you go? Um, that's all That's all good advice. Um, I meant to mention on the topic of distribution, etc., um, we're creating a small toolkit um, for any of the local artists in the local area as to where it's maybe good to gig. There's going to be information on where the local recording studios and one of the other sections that will be sort of like a little small bit on, you know, distribution and it'll have the links to TuneCore and um, all those other, um, you know, Detto Music and all the other ones you can do with. So that is something that the, um, that the artists will be able to get uh, in touch with. Have you any other uh, little bits of information you want to share before we, before we let you go? Um, I just think like you, you have to enjoy it. Like, like a lot of the stuff when you talk about the music industry can seem kind of scary and can kind of suck the fun out of it a little bit. Cause like it starts to feel like a job, doesn't it? When you get, that you're going, I have to do a press release and I have to sort this out and I have to do this and I have to do that and I have to do that. You have to like maybe take a step back sometimes and go, you know, this isn't your job at the minute. You know, you would like to make it your job, but you have to remember that you're, sharing the song because you're proud of it and you're sharing this piece of music because you're proud of it and you're proud of what you and perhaps maybe your friends have done and maybe it's a vehicle to play more live gigs maybe it's a vehicle to <clears throat> make a fan base online but you just have to like enjoy it as well like enjoy the fact that 10 people have listened to it because that's 10 more people that listened to it than had the other day so like you know celebrate those wee small wins don't be getting into it straight away thinking that you're going to be doing 15 billion streams on Spotify. Get into it going, yes, we got 100 like people listening to it. Or yes, 25 people showed up to the gig. Like you got to celebrate those wee bits. Well, thank you very much, uh, Phil. As I've said before, um, we'll have copies of his book available to the artists who were involved. And uh, your Chill the Beats show, um, it's on, it's like, is there a time for it? And you listen to it anytime or? Yeah, it... it's on Spotify. If you type in Chill the Beats, right? It's C-H-I-L-L-D-A-B-E-A-T-S. It's all one word on Spotify. And it is the best music show anywhere in the world. <laughs> it's all it's all about like awesome, amazing chill music. So if you want to check it out, please do. I think that's definitely something to be listening to at this day and age. Um, thank you very much for having, uh, having a chat with us, Phil. Okay. No sweat, man. Thanks very much, Joseph. 